We are live. Good morning. Uh, this is May the 7th. It is Thursday. It is the last Thursday of this rather unusual year. Um, today we are going to work towards finishing this unit on <clears throat> industrialism, material, uh, Materialism, industrialism, realism, and impressionism, and actually post-impressionism. Uh, yeah, the art movements really get kind of, they're, they're, they just come uh, after the age of romanticism. They come rapidly and rapidly changing. Post-impressionism, modernism, <clears throat> post-modernism, cubism. Yeah, I know. Uh, and so... That being said, let me see. There it is, yes. Let's begin. Um, <coughs> and so, yeah, will we finish today? Um, no. Will we finish tomorrow? Probably. That means I'll move our test back until Monday. Um, you know, I mean, guys, I think these tests are pretty simple. You have the study guide, look at the study guide. The lectures help tremendously because basically I give you the answers in the lectures. And, uh, you know, so a test Monday really is not that big of a deal. And that leads us with Tuesday and Wednesday. Hmm. <clears throat> what do we do then? We'll think of something. Okay. And so uh, let's begin talking about realism. Again, realism, as you know, you saw in that video by Paul Sargent. Now that uh, video by Paul Sargent is actually really good. Um, those of you, Mr. Halleck, who took me for AP Euro, recall that I utilized a lot of Tom Ritchie videos. Uh, I'm becoming a Paul Sargent fan. Uh, <clears throat> Paul Sargent uh, is not nearly so arrogant as uh, that other person I can name, um, myself included, but uh, he also breaks things down into simple language, which I kind of like. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, Paul Sargent doesn't have the following as Uncle Tom, but no accounting for taste. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, that that's a very good video there uh, where he talks about realism, what involved realism, realistic painting. If you noticed in your assignments on Canvas Day, I put in not just that video, a number of pictures that I had uh, of art. You know, one of the things that since, uh, be honest, I anticipate being locked in all summer. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back through my computer and pull up all my pictures that a lot of them simply have numbers, you know, which I don't know what those numbers mean, but I'm going to rename them and give them the names of what they actually are so they're much easier for me to find. Um, this Mac computer, which I've grown very fond of in the 10 years I've had it, uh, has, I'd swear, it probably has about 2,000 pictures in it. And, uh, you know, they're, <coughs> they're not given names. And so I've got to fix that. I've got to change that. Particularly if, you know, there's that chance that we could start off next year doing this. And to be real honest, going forward now, you guys who are seniors, yeah, uh, won't have to worry about this as much. But you guys are underclassmen. Probably what's going to start happening now if we ever have snow days again. You only, you know, we only had one snow day this past year. One. Um, if we ever have snow days again, and that that's an interesting question of whether or not we may have snow days. I believe that I believe the world is warming. That's why we have. We don't have the deep freezes that we used to have. We don't have the. Uh, 
missing five straight days of school because there was so much snow on the ground. We haven't had that in a while. Last year we had one snow day, and I can remember since I've been in the Boone County system, which has only been about 13 years now, that one year we had no snow days. That is rare. To be honest, in my opinion, uh, what that means is that the weather patterns are shifting north, um, which is disastrous. I mean, it really is uh, disastrous. Aside from the polar ice caps melting and the permafrost regions uh, of Siberia and Upper Canada um, warming up, that means they're releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the weather patterns are shifting. And that will change climate, turn what had once been um, lush jungles into more arid areas. For example, a lot of people don't understand, you know, that one reason why there's such a massive migration from Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, into trying to get into the United States is that the weather patterns have shifted. Those areas have had tremendously less rainfall. And their crops, their, those poor farmers, their crops have been really affected by that uh, lack of rainfall. And so a lot of they're just getting out. And they're heading this way. And so, yeah. Um, will we have snow days? Uh, like we used to. You know, the thing is, probably what we'll have is we'll have more years of not so many snow days, but then we'll have a year where we're just going to get dumped on and put into the icebox. Because one of the, one of the uh, symptoms of global warming is more extreme weather, more rapidly extreme weather, you know, including drought summers. Uh, you know, I don't mean to be that guy who's trying to make you afraid telling you uh, ghost stories, but. So we were talking about realism, weren't we? Yes. Realism in art was matched by realism in writing. In other words, the books of the era no longer told of romantic stories, no longer told of you know, last of the Mohicans or uh, heroic Uncas lays his life down for this girl, Alice, <clears throat> uh, or anything of that nature. They become realistic, meaning that instead of the hero doing heroic things, the hero acts like a normal person with fears and flaws, you know. Um... And the realistic movement in art and in writing was a reaction to the romantic, uh, but totally unrealistic hero, who and depicted life, love, and adventures in a form that might, you know, this is actually what happens. Charles Dickens was grouped in with a realist, although Charles Dickens kind of bridges the gap between romanticism and realism. I mean, for example, you can't, can't uh, deny the fact that your favorite story and mine, A Christmas Carol, is a romantic story. It has ghosts in it, has uh, the person at the center coming to his uh, senses, and in the end, you know, saying, I've been a bad person, I'm going to change, uh, and I'm going to take care of Tiny Tim. That's romantic, but also unrealistic. You know, if Charles Dickens had written The Christmas Carol as a realistic novel, uh, <laughs> Scrooge would have been buried and uh, gone on to face his judgment with all the chains. I mean, that's realistic. Uh, anyway, so uh, Charles Dickens had grown up in the industrial cruelties that were all too common in England at the time. And once again, I've told you this before. Charles Dickens had that unique background that he was born into wealth. 
And over time, he, uh, his family lost that wealth. And so his teenage years, he was working class, lower working class. And so he saw both ends of the spectrum. Dickens had grown up and he'd, he'd witnessed firsthand the cruelties of the industrial age, uh, child labor, the fact that the city smelled awful, you know, and he knew both ends of the spectrum. And that gave him the background to write David Copperfield. But more importantly, a, a book that you have never, I know you're thinking David Copperfield, he's that magician. He's that magic guy, right? Well, where do you think he got his name? David Copperfield is a, uh, David Copperfield is a story about a young child being uh, brought up in the English workhouses. Could I have more pudding, sir? More pudding? How can you have any pudding if you haven't eaten your meat? Anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, but now, David Copperfield's book that really was realistic is something called Bleak House. Uh, Bleak House was a better portrait of the English legal system with all its grit uh, and its very skulking but realistic characters, real people doing real things, uh, alcoholism, criminal, criminal activities. Uh, Howard Dickens was able to make his characters both realistic and entirely unlikely. His novels, Dickens, not like Great Expectations. If you ever, and I, I know some of you guys have read Great Expectations. Great Expectations, where uh, it begins with Pip being snatched up by this convict, and the convict threatening is threatening Pip's life, so that Pip will bring him food, which Pip does, and then the convict leaves. And then throughout the rest of his life, Pip becomes the benefactor of, you know, some acts of generosity, which in the end, Pip finds out was that convict. Which, come to think of, it's really romantic. So his novels were full of remote coincidences and sentimentality, which made them popular amongst a dreaming audience during the uh, grisly days of the Industrial Revolution. Dickens' French contemporary was Gustave Flaubert, who wrote Madame Bovary, which was a novel about a woman who was trying to cope with her age. I mean, she was getting older. Like, that never happens. And, you know, she was trying to cope with this. She'd grown up in wealth. She'd grown up in glamour. And she kept looking in the mirror, and mirrors don't lie. And she eventually turns to adultery and finally commits suicide. You know, um, a grisly but not unrealistic scenario. So the novel scandalized the proper French reading public because here was a novel about a woman, about her, you know, trials where she's the featured character and she eventually commits suicide. Roman numeral six. The Industrial Revolution brought forth the modern city with both its luxuries and its traumas. In modern cities like Paris, London, Amsterdam, and New York, uh, by this time had police forces, lighted streets, running water, and sewage. Now, here we're talking about the latter part of the 19th century. Trust me, in the early part of the 19th century, those cities I just mentioned were open sewers, particularly London and Paris, uh, and New York, to be honest. And I know all oh, you're saying, oh, my God, he's going to talk about sewage systems again. Well, I am. Uh, I mean, they fascinate me. But uh, I used to watch this series on the History Channel called um, Ancient Cities. And it talked about what life would have been like to have lived in this city or that city in the middle part or the early part of the 19th century. And, it, and one of the cities it talked about was New York. And it talked about how in New York in the days before they had a, uh, a citywide sewer system that, you know, they 
New York was still this crowded city where everybody lived actually more densely packed than they do today in New York City. And of course, everybody poops. And there were outhouses that were out on the street and people would use them. And but the it it didn't have anywhere to go. And during the colder days of the wintertime, it would freeze and continue to pile up. And they said during the uh, hardest freezes that it could be four feet deep and you walk on top of it, frozen. And then it eventually melted. But anyway, these cities also had crime, overcrowded tenements. A tenement is where several families live in the same building, share walls, large numbers of people living in one room. You know, the basically the... Uh, the growing pains of an early industrial revolution. And of course, pollution. Their pollution was different than, our, than the pollution we have today. It wasn't so much smokestacks, although that did exist. It was water pollution. And also uh, the kind of pollution that horses leave behind when they go up and down the streets. And so, yeah. However, with the invention of the elevator, which is on your test, the elevator and the steel beam, buildings began to rise more than four stories for the first time in history. Yes, and that was made, and this is on your test, that was made possible by the invention of the elevator and the steel beam. I mean, they had had steel, literally, you know, for thousands of years. The problem with steel was in producing it. Well, they did, did the Industrial Revolution, they developed a process to make lots of steel. Uh, and then in the latter part of the 19th century, they, somebody, and I forget what the guy's name was, invented uh, the elevator, uh, which enabled you to haul large amounts of things up and down a building. Because prior to the invention of the elevator, all buildings were less than four stories. Okay, so wrap your head around that. That means, for example, consider Cincinnati. Cincinnati of the 19th century. Cincinnati before, you know, Cincinnati Day is skyscrapers. But consider Cincinnati. In 1850, the population density of the city of Cincinnati, oh, 1870, sorry. Uh, the population density of the city of Cincinnati was 100,000 people per square mile, living where downtown Cincinnati is now. That's much more than the population density of Cincinnati is now. Because most people who work in downtown Cincinnati, I mean, at night, downtown Cincinnati, most of those buildings are empty. Think about that. In downtown Cincinnati, at night, today, most of those buildings, they're empty. They're office buildings. You know, some hotels, but most of them are office buildings. And at night, they're empty. But uh, they couldn't be empty. Uh, buildings couldn't be empty in, the, in uh, 1870 because people had to live close to where they worked. And you do recall that in the city of Cincinnati, the major... Uh, industry was pork, pigs, pig processing. That meant that they marched pigs from farms all over southern Ohio. They marched them, herded them into Cincinnati, and they marched them into the stockyards where those pigs were then turned into sausage, pork chops, lard, et cetera, et cetera. And this was done all in buildings of less than four stories. And so in the bottom building, you'd have your, that's the assembly where they brought the stock in. And then they would, of course, execute, they would kill, slaughter the pigs. And further up and further up, they had the processing where they would cut the pigs up and turn them into whatever. Um, that's a mess. You know, there's they, a lot of waste. And I'm not just talking about pig waste. I'm talking about animal parts 
uh, that were not utilized, although they really utilized as much as the pigs they could. But pig smell. And add to that, you're also talking about lots and lots and lots of people. They have to live there. They live in that area. People who work in Cincinnati today, most of them live in Mason. They live in Price Hill. They live uh, Mount Healthy. They live in Claremont County, and they drive in Cincinnati. They, they had to walk. And so to walk, you had to live in walking distance. And uh, that meant you lived pretty close to where the pigs were being processed. And once again, process is a nice word for slaughtering. 100,000 people per square mile, all living in buildings less than four stories. Oh, yeah. They didn't have air conditioning. Imagine the summers. Pigs, overcrowding, and Cincinnati humidity. Yeah. Now, if you were one of the lucky ones, if you were one of the wealthy, and you, here's what's interesting, you worked in Cincinnati, you would then walk across the Roebling Bridge into northern Kentucky, into Covington and Newport. And because those houses that you see down there, all the little row houses that are so close together and go straight up three stories and they're all little thin houses, uh, that's where the rich people live. And if you notice, if you look at those houses, if you go down there and really take a good look at them, most of those houses were built 1840, 1850, 1860. Um, yeah, and that was where the wealthy people lived because they could get away from their work. But the average person, no, the average person lived in Cincinnati uh, processing pigs. And so, yeah. That kind of pollution that we're talking about. Okay, uh, with the invention of the elevator, buildings began to rise more than four stories, and the skyscraper became a reality, and the landscape of the modern city was born. Yeah. The first skyscraper was the uh, Guarantee Building, with Guarantee was the name of a life insurance corporation, in Buffalo, New York. Iron and steel and elevators, and that's your question, made high-rise buildings a possibility and a reality. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, you can't look at the impression style of Claude Monet, although I did give you a Monet, Monet's Water Lilies. Um, that's impressionism, but it shows what big city living was like. Uh, yeah. The Guaranteed Building of Buffalo, New York, was the first skyscraper. It was architected by Louis H. Sullivan and had the first modern elevator. During this time, Paris becomes known as the City of Lights because, thank you, Thomas Edison, um, they lit up the city. And as the City of Lights, it stayed on all night long. I mean, once again, Thomas Edison's invention of the light bulb may turn the world into a place that was open 24 hours a day. Slowly at first, but yeah. So, building a modern city like St. Petersburg, and by the way, St. Petersburg, Russia, and Washington, D.C. are mentioned in your test. They have one thing in common. Both St. Petersburg, well, actually have several things in common, but both St. Petersburg, Washington, and Washington, D.C. were originally built on swamp land. Swamp land that had to be drained uh, to build the city. Uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, was built by Peter the Great of Russia. A king, uh, a czar, I'm sorry, a czar who had no compunction about... Uh, the lives of his citizenry. It was said that the city of St. Petersburg, Russia, was built on mud and bones. You say, what does that mean? Well, St. Petersburg, the, the site he chose was a swamp. 
Uh, but it was also would have made a perfect seaport. He just had to get rid of the swamp. So Saint, uh, so Peter brought in literally thousands of workers who worked 12 months out of the year. And they worked on draining this swamp. And all of the stone upon which the city sat had to be hauled in from other places without locomotives, without automation. I mean, it was grueling, back-breaking work. And so these workers, I mean, you can be worked to death. Many of them died, though, of in the summertime. If you've ever been in the far north in the summertime, they have mosquitoes that will eat you for lunch. Mosquito-borne illnesses in the summer. And then in the wintertime, exposure. I mean, it's one thing to be cold. Another thing to be wet and cold. And when you're, you know, working in the mud, you get wet and cold. And yeah, exposure. 25,000 people died in the construction of, of uh, St. Petersburg, building Peter's new capital, um, which he was so proud of. Now, Washington, D.C. was also had an interesting history. First of all, Washington, D.C., if you ever look at the grid layout of the city, Washington, D.C. Um, was, as you know, D.C. is actually located within the boundaries of the state of Maryland. And uh, when they first went to build the city, the uh, Continental Congress or the Congress commissioned this dude, this architect, this engineer, um, and to show how much they trusted American engineers, they went out and got they went out and got this French guy. His name Pierre de l'Enfant, E N F A N T, and this guy uh, was a jerk. I mean, he was always complaining. First of all, it's in the swamp, it's in the wilderness, going to build a city, he's all mad. Uh, and to help him engineer the city, the Congress gave him the use of a slave. Uh, the slave's name was Benjamin Banneker. And this Pierre de Lienfant kept complaining, complaining, and about this, that, and the other. And eventually... He quits. He walks off the job in the middle of the whole engineering of the city of Washington, D.C., laying out the city of Washington, D.C. He throws his head and said, I'm going back to France. And, of course, Continental Congress is like, what are we going to do? Well, fortunately, and this is one of those stories in history that doesn't get told enough. Uh, fortunately, this slave, Benjamin Banneker, very, very intelligent. He, he had the plans memorized. He knew exactly what uh, the Congress wanted and what Pierre de L'Enfant wanted in his design. And so the Congress wanted and what Pierre de L'Enfant wanted in his design. And so the city was laid out then, not by this fancy damn French engineer, but by this African slave, who I'm sure when his work was finished, went back to being a slave. Because this, after all, is America. I mean, remember, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson both owned slaves. And you don't own slaves by being a nice person. So, yeah, tear down their monuments, too. <coughs> but anyway, so um, the city of Washington, though, now this is also reflected in your test. Most cities are built today, most modern cities are built on what you call a grid pattern, a grid pattern, a grid pattern where all the streets run north and south and east and west. Squares. Hmm? Washington, D.C. has two patterns. The first pattern is a wheel pattern, meaning that the center of the city of Washington, D.C. is the Capitol building. Now, one street pattern has all the major streets 
of the city of Washington, D.C., radiating outward like the spokes of a wheel. Like the spokes of a wheel. Now laid on top of that uh, wheel spoke pattern is a grid pattern. So there are two patterns, test question, there are two patterns in the building of Washington, D.C. There's the wheel pattern where once again, the Capitol where the Congress meets is the center of the wheel. And from that center, all these streets radiate out from, radiate out from the center in equal distance apart, just like I said, just like the spokes of a giant wheel. <clears throat> but the second pattern laid on top of the wheel pattern is the grid pattern, streets running north, south, east, and west. You do know, of course, that if you've ever been to Washington, all the streets have the names of states. Yeah. I mean, except for Constitution Avenue and things like that. <clears throat> okay. But yeah, St. Uh, Petersburg, Washington, D.C., interesting cities that were built in the 18th century. Um, Paris, however, the city of Paris, had first been built as a Roman outpost in the days of the Roman Empire, in the first century B.C., maybe second century. And its streets went like this. Originally, kind of like Boston. If you ever been to Boston, Old Town Boston, easy to get lost. Same thing for Pittsburgh. But anyway, uh, Paris had all these narrow, winding streets. Uh, modern cities, as it says there, are built on a grid. G R I D, grid. North, south, east, west. Um, in Paris alone, though, under the reign of, of Emperor Napoleon III, who was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, and he just thought he was cool, the city was transformed. He, Napoleon III, destroyed over 1,000 old medieval-era homes and replaced them with streets and north-south boulevards that had very wide lanes that could not only accommodate lots of traffic, but could allow troop movements or fire brigade movements in case of riots or fires or anything like that. Now, finally, the city of Chicago, my favorite city, the Great Chicago Fire, and we talked about already the, the great uh, diphtheria epidemic in 1874, the Great Chicago Fire resulted in the construction of a fire retardant first ever skyscraper. I mean, I think that uh, it was a latter part, it was like 18, Chicago Fire, I don't recall, Mr. Halleck, what year it was. I think it was toward the end of the 1860s, maybe 1870s, that uh, city of Chicago got fire, caught fire and burned to the ground. Burned to the ground because uh, the city was pretty much entirely made of wood. After that, they replaced that with brick. You know what? We are going to stop here with Roman numeral 7. We will pick up tomorrow, and your test is postponed till Tuesday. We're going to say that, till Tuesday. How about that? Tuesday. And with that, I will leave you. Uh, of your own devices. It's a great day. Go out and enjoy the day safely, of course. And um, I'll see you tomorrow.